Okay, the recording is on. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to BC214, our course on developing the human spirit. We're going to continue our journey, exploring, learning. So i um, just like to invite somebody to pray with the class and we will get started. Could somebody please unmute your mic, pray with us and we will start. Anyone, please. Just a second. I'll say. Go ahead, Mangi. Father, we thank you for. This morning again, Lord, we thank you for giving us this opportunity to come and learn about our spiritual being, Lord, our primary being of, of us being, being spiritual, Lord, and us being originated from you, Lord. We pray, Father, as Pastor Shish teaches us, Lord, empower his spirit, and also let your little spirit, Lord, prepare our heart, Lord, so that we may receive whatever you are giving us through Pastor Shish, Lord. We pray all this in your mighty name, Lord Jesus. Amen. 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 All right. Thank you, Mangi, and welcome, everyone, once again. Uh, I'm sorry I uh, just put out this, the PDF uh, just literally a few minutes before class. So uh, you may or may not have got it yet, but that's okay. I will share the PDF, and then you can download it uh, after class. So today we're going to focus uh, perhaps on material that may be uh, familiar uh, to some of us. Uh, there are two things I just want to cover today. Or one is um, to emphasize to all of us that we are primarily spirit beings or spiritual beings. Uh, I want to emphasize that. And then I want to touch upon uh, developing the born again human spirit. Um, you know, what are the things that we could do to develop the the born again human spirit? That means we are focusing on those who have been saved and regenerated. They have the life of God. So now how do we develop that uh, born again human spirit? Just hopefully we'll be able to cover uh, both of these uh, in today's uh, lecture, right? So what I want us to understand is that the human spirit, that means your spirit, or I'm referring to myself, my human spirit, is the real person. And the human spirit has things that we would normally associate or we are normally understand it with, you know, a person. So the, the human spirit is the real person with personality, faculties, and functions. So personality, generally, you will say, okay, you know, these are the person's characteristics or traits, or, you know, we would describe it in terms of interests. Uh, you know, if you think about a person, you know, or in fact, all each one of us here in the class, uh, if we all get to know each other, now, a part of our understanding of each other would be, you know, hey, this person has these kinds of interests, uh, include this, this person has these kind of inclinations. Um, and of course, there are these faculties and functions that are expressed through the person, what the, what the person is able to say and do and think and uh, all those kinds of things. Um, and so we understand it uh, uh, very clearly in the natural standpoint. That means, you know, when we interact with people, uh, we, we recognize, you know, this person is like this, this person is like that, you know, this person has these, uh, this kind of a personality, maybe quiet, maybe very outspoken, maybe very strong, maybe, maybe very faithful, maybe very sincere, maybe very genuine, you know, all these things which we use to describe 
uh, uh, an individual's uh, personality. What I want us to understand is that the same can be said about the spiritual person, that the spirit, the human spirit has all of this. And uh, really, it is the expression of the human spirit coming through the soul and the body that we are seeing on the outside. So we need to start thinking in terms of this, that the human spirit is the real person. And uh, just as we develop the soul and the body, our focus is to learning is to learn how to develop the spiritual, the born again spiritual person. That's our focus as believers. How do you develop the spiritual person? And we also want to explore, you know, what 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 the realms of possibilities in the spirit, and how can we grow into those things as we progress in the course. But just one passage, and you know, you could, we could look at uh, several different passages to uh, to emphasize that uh, the spirit, the spiritual person, uh, is the real person. But I just uh, listed one verse, one passage, Second Peter, uh, chapter one. Uh, verses 13 to 15. Can somebody read that out loud for us, please? Second uh, Peter chapter 1, verse 13 to 15. Sir, shall I read it? Please go ahead. I think it right as long as I am in this body to stir up by way of reminder, since I know that the putting off my body will be soon, as our Lord Jesus Christ made clear to me, and I will make every effort so that after my departure you may be able at any time to recall these things thank mm. you thank you um notice how in in this verse and we will you know we of course find this in other places as well where here it is peter who is distinguishing between him and his body yeah he says in verse 13 as long as I am in this, and uh, the New King James uses the word tent, which is quite interesting. Uh, of course, other versions would use, uh, would translate it, you know, more, lit, you know, more contemporary as in body. But he says, as long as I am in this tent. So the house, uh, the body is just the house, is just the tent. But the real person is inside the house. So he says, I am in this tent. So I'm going to remind you. In a certain believers, I'm going to keep reminding you. And then in verse 14, he says, I am going to put off my tent. So the real person is actually inside. And uh, he's getting to, you know, uh, exit. He's kind of getting ready to leave the house. Peter is talking about himself and uh, his imminent uh, death. So just one example here to show us that the real person is inside the house. The body is just the dwelling place. And then to build that up further, the human spirit is the real person. And we have looked at this verse before, for Spirit 3 was 4. Now we understand the context. The context is uh, Peter is writing uh, and he's telling, you know, um, Women, uh, uh, spe specifically here, is saying, okay, you know, don't focus on the outward adorning, but let it be the inner person. But in that process, he's revealing something to us about the inner person, and that's our focus. First Peter 3 and verse 4. Could somebody uh, just read the scripture text? You can leave out these Greek words. Uh, somebody could read the scripture text for us, please. Rather, let it be the hidden portion of the heart with the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in the sight of God. Amen. Mm. Amen. So, that is what he says. The hidden person. Okay. So, this word anthropos is a generic word, which just means human. Now, it could refer to a male or a female, right? So, uh, so the, the, the human spirit has no gender. You know, it's a person. So he says, let it be the hidden person of the heart. So the heart is 
a person. The, the spirit, the human spirit is a person. And the heart is also referred to as spirit, you know, pneuma, the word that we have been, we mentioned earlier. So the heart, spirit, person, right? So the heart or the human, the heart or the human spirit is really, is the real person, but it's the hidden person, meaning it's not the outer person, as in the visible human body. The human body we have already established is only the tent, is only the house. But the person on the inside, that is the spirit, the spirit person, is the real person. And God is looking at that person in the sight of God. Right? So the, the character of this person. So this person has attributes. And uh, in this case, uh, Peter is emphasizing the attributes of gentleness and quietness. So that means this hidden person has character Characteristics or traits, yeah, and uh, those characteristics or those traits are what God is looking at. And in this case, He's saying these these characteristics or traits of uh, gentleness and quietness are precious and beautiful in the sight of God. And of course, the context here is also to man, to people, to other people. Because he's talking about, you know, the adorning. He says, okay, don't, don't focus so much on the outward adorning. But in other words, uh, you know, uh, that is what people see. But he says, you know, let the quiet, gentle and quiet spirit, let the incorruptible beauty see so this character traits of the human spirit is incorruptible unlike the outward adorning that we wear that uh, we may have which will fade you know that will go away the outward appearance but the traits of your inner person the real person gentleness, quietness, and then we could add other characteristics. You know, you could add things like compassion, maybe generosity, maybe endurance, maybe patience, you know, all of these other character traits of the inner person. One, it's, it's going to be visible to people. And that, as he says, incorruptible beauty, meaning this will never fade away. You know, you can live, uh, uh, you know, whether you're 40 or 50 or 60, 70, 80, or however long, these character traits of the inner person are not going to fade. You'll be able to have that with you. Whereas, you know, the outer, other features and the adorning, that those things will fade away. So that it's, it's visible to other people. That means the personality of my human spirit and I will mention this a little later, the personality of my human spirit is then expressed through my soul and body, which people are able to see. That's one thing. But also, it is precious in the sight of God. That means God is also interested in those character traits of my human spirit or the real person. And that's precious in the sight of God. That is these positive or these good character traits, Christ-like traits of gentleness, quietness, compassion, generosity, uh, patience, endurance, all of that. Uh, we will see later on, you know, and which we are all familiar with, the fruit of the Spirit, Galatians 5. Developing those kinds of traits in the human spirit, of course, with the help of the Holy Spirit, is in the sight of God very precious. 
So there's a lot that we're picking up from here on the human spirit. And I'll just quickly repeat it and we'll uh, reiterate it again. First of all, we said that the heart, or also referred to as spirit, is the real person. It's the hidden person. It's the real person. Then we said the hidden person has traits, character traits. And in this course, he's just mentioning two, which is gentleness and quietness. But we could definitely add to the list. And Galatians 5, which we will look at later, gives us other traits or virtues. But this is part of the personality of the hidden person, the man, the person on the inside. Then we said number four, that these virtues, character, tra character traits of the hidden person, that is your heart or your spirit, is expressed through your soul and body so that people are able to see it. Right? They are able to see it. That means your inner personality is being visible, expressed through the soul and the body for other people to see. Then fourthly, we also see that this, these virtues, these character traits of the human heart is incorruptible. You know, it's what Peter refers to as incorruptible beauty. It's, it's, it'll be that it's enduring through time. And fifthly, lastly, we said, this is also very precious in the sight of God. I mean, this is what God is looking for. The personality, the virtues, the character traits of the human person, or the, the human heart or the spirit. Right? So you and I must begin to think. So we are learning to think in terms of the human spirit or the hidden person being the real person. And I think I've uh, said this before. We need to think as what is the condition of my heart or my human spirit? And how do we you know, develop that, which is what we will learn. So now extending what we have seen here in First Peter 3, we can say that the hidden person, that is the heart or the spirit, has its own traits and characteristics which determine the individual's personality. Because we said that, you know, people are going to see that from outside, and that's what describes your personality. So they will see, example, gentleness, quietness, or other things, you know, like generosity or passion or inclination. Okay, this person is very compassionate towards poor people. Oh, this person is very compassionate towards, uh, you know, maybe uh, some other situation, you know, or this person is very passionate about uh, providing education, whatever, you know, those are the things that are coming out actually from your spirit. And people begin to see that. And one example that uh, I'm just, uh, I put here was um, an incident actually, uh, in Luke chapter 9, when, uh, and I, I haven't quoted all the verses in that passage, but you could read from verse 15 to 56, you'll see that as Jesus was passing through the village, uh, Jesus and his disciples were passing through Samaria at one time, uh, they didn't receive Jesus, uh, not interested. And so James and John, uh, they turn around to Jesus. And they say, Lord, shall we call fire down to destroy this village? As Elijah did. So they're even quoting Old Testament. So, you know, Elijah called fire down uh, to destroy the people, you know. And so there are several occasions that you, you'll find. So, shall we call fire down? And Jesus rebuked them. And it's very interesting what he told them at that point. He said, you do not know what manner of spirit you are of. Or what sort of spirit 
you know what is what is what is really coming out of your heart you know in other words to put it in simple words we want to paraphrase it he said you guys really don't know yourself and you guys don't know what's really moving you at this point on the outside it seemed very spiritual what they were asking and they were even quoting scripture you know uh, like elijah we'll call fire down but really the motivation was wrong you say how do we know it's so strong because if you read the verses prior to this um, they've just gone through uh, expressing how first they felt you know that they were like the chosen people the elite the exclusive ones because in the verses prior to this uh, one incident they they you know they saw somebody else using the name of Jesus and they said Lord we have to stop him because he's not part of our group so immediately you could see that by this time the disciples had some sort of a feeling that hey we are the chosen 12 you know we are the elite ones the exclusive ones you can count that comes through and then right after that there's another incident where they're asking God you know who's who's the greatest amongst us yeah so already the motivations uh, is off and so now coming here into this village uh, it's maybe bitterness it may be revenge it may be the fact that they are self-righteous or that they are you know they, they have certain status as disciples of jesus or they just uh, angry and short-tempered that it's something that's you know a wrong motivation even though the thing that they were asking to do had biblical precedence you know elijah did it let's do it you know elijah was a prophet hey we are apostles let's do it it seemed very spiritual but the motivation was wrong and so jesus rebuked them as he didn't encourage them he rebuked them, or you could say he scolded them, or he, you know, he corrected them. Hey, you don't even know what's motivating you. You know, you don't know what's coming out of your heart, you know, your inner person. So that the the, the things that motivate us come out of our spirit, and they describe. Uh, our personality they describe our of course they determine our actions our words and our actions and that's what we see here in the next verse uh, matthew 15 again this passage i'm not reading the whole passage but in verse 19 jesus is saying out of the heart right so we can re replace the word spirit or heart well, you know as we saw earlier in first Peter 3 4 the interchangeable so out of the spirit out of the spirit person out of your inner person come thoughts and your actions so where do these thoughts and actions come from come from your heart what people see are the expressions of our thoughts that is words and actions and they the sum total of words and actions they use that to define our personality right so when you get to know a person you listen to the way they speak and what they say what's important to them you listen to them uh, sorry you see them you know what they're involved in engaged in, and then you frame get a uh, some sort of a understanding of who they are as a person but where do those thoughts and actions come from Jesus said, out of the spirit, out of that hidden person, these thoughts and actions are coming. So if we develop the hidden person right, and we nurture the right virtues, the right character traits in the heart, in the spiritual person, then what will happen is, the thoughts, words, and actions that come will be, you know, precious, will be virtuous in the sight of God. So 
while we know we have to discipline the body, we need to train the mind, fine. But the real person we have to deal with is the heart, the spiritual person. And we shape and mold and develop the spiritual person right. Then thoughts, words and deeds will be right. I'm talking about right in the sight of God. So keep these things in mind because they form the basis of what we're going to do in the coming weeks. Now, let me just mention the faculties and the functions of the human spirit, which we are going to discuss in detail. Um, the five faculties of the human spirit. Now, you would have seen some of this in the course on the Holy Spirit when we uh, in the book, uh, Gifts of the Spirit, because we, we talk a little bit about this. Um, what we, and I'll just mention it here, but we're going to get into the details of it in the coming, not the next chapter, but the chapter later. Um, so what we can understand from scripture is that the human spirit has faculties, just like the human body. So when we look at the human body, we say, no, okay, uh, for, a, for any human person, they've got to have these five faculties. They've got to be able to see, hear, feel, smell, and taste. And if any one of these faculties uh, are sent, we call them senses, if any one of these five senses uh, are not working properly, um, then it's not good, right? The, that particular sense or faculty has been impaired. And, uh, you know, we try to heal them, help them recover. But in general, we say every human person has five senses. And we can map these five senses to the human spirit in scripture. In scripture, we see that the human spirit or the inner person has at least the ability, these five faculties. Now, we need to develop these five faculties because these five faculties enable us to interact with the spiritual realm. And the more sharp these five faculties are, I'm talking about in the spirit, the human spirit, uh, the more we can engage with the spiritual realm. The faculties of our spirit, our human spirit. And so as believers, uh, we need to develop these faculties which we will discuss. Similarly, we can see in scripture the seven functions of the born again human spirit. Now, I specifically state born again because uh, our focus is going to be on uh, uh, developing the functions of the human spirit in the context of being a believer and in, in our relationship with God, right? So uh, these same functions can also be used in a wrong way, meaning, uh, and, and we will mention this uh, a little later, but uh, in a wrong way sense, in the sense that those who are, you know, who are engaging with the dark side, with demonic spirits, practicing witchcraft and all that, uh, you know, in some way, they're going to use their spirit, spirit faculties and functions to do wrong things. Yeah, they're engaging with the dark side. But our focus is on uh, the born again spirit. So, what are the seven functions of the human spirit, specifically the born again human spirit? Conscience, and we see all of this in scripture, and we will develop this uh, as in in uh, coming chapters. Conscience, um, and this is so important because the conscience, at a very basic level, tells you and me what's right, what's wrong. What is acceptable to God, what is not acceptable to God? The sad thing is, even believers can act against their conscience. So we're not talking about even the Bible or the Holy Spirit. We're just talking about the conscience. Now, of course, you know, uh, the conscience is something God-given. And it is a built-in uh, 
if you want to use the word moral indicator. What is right and wrong in every person? But in the, especially for the born again believer, we have to live in good conscience. Good conscience. But even if the born again believer, even if he, he doesn't know chapter and verse, and if he doesn't know how to listen to the Holy Spirit, if he will just live in good conscience, he's going to be living right before God. But even a born again believer can violate his own, his or her own conscience. But what we will see later on is, even if a born again believer lives like that, just violating their own conscience, they will destroy their own faith. Just that, just, just, just violating our own conscience, we will destroy our faith in God. And we will see it in scripture. But sad to say, you know, when we look around, we see that some of the actions even Christians do, like you, you wonder, how could in good conscience, could that person even do that? Example, you hear about, you know, uh, uh, people, I'm talking about believers, maybe they rob money from the church, or maybe they misuse money from, you know, the church. They, they just do things that are wrong. And you wonder, didn't they even have a conscience? I mean, forget about chapter and verse and forget about the leading of the Holy Spirit, just basic thing. What about their own conscience? What happened to it? Well, even though they were believers, they were violating their own conscience. And the result, we could see. They may have destroyed their faith or come close to that. Okay, we'll talk about it in detail. So conscience. Second thing, second function of the human spirit is the ability to know, to receive knowledge, just like, the human mind in the natural acquires knowledge and grows in knowledge in the natural. The human spirit receives knowledge, spiritual revelation, knowledge, knowing, knowing things of the spiritual realm. And we will learn that uh, the inspiration of the Almighty gives the human spirit understanding. So there are times when you have knowledge, which is not what you have received through information, meaning information channels. You have not received it through the five senses, but it is coming from the inspiration of God. But that's part of our spirit function, knowing. Of course, there is other ways by which we, our spirit knows it is through the word of God. But we must understand the inspiration process by which your human spirit receives knowledge outside of what is coming through the five natural senses. That is through your reading of scripture and so on. Uh, and, and please understand, Everything must be tested by scripture, right? So even what is received through inspiration is subject to the written scriptures because the written scriptures is our standard, right? We will get into the details of all of each of these seven functions. I'm just introducing it or mentioning it here. Number three, uh, third function, which the human spirit is capable, the born again human spirit is capable of is worship and fellowship with God. And this is very amazing. You know, it's very amazing uh, how the human spirit can fellowship with God. God is spirit, you are spirit. And the reason he created a spirit, soul, and body is our spirit can fellowship with him. It's like, you know, if you want to put it in simple terms, it's like be friends or have that relationship with him. Now, 
a simple example, and it, this might be a little crude, but let's just think about it. You know, in to really have fellowship with a certain class of being, you need to be in that example. You know, again, this may be a crude example, but you know, I have to be a dog if I really want to understand the dog world. As a human, uh, to some extent, I can understand, you know, dogs, uh, and, and 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 you know, relate and talk and you know, so on. But I don't necessarily understand, you know, will not be able to understand everything about the dog world. You have to be in that same class of, of being. And it's not possible, right? We are humans, they're animals, and they're a particular kind of animal. So like that, you have different kinds of animals. And you, need to, you know, to really understand that kind of an animal, you you know, have to be in that class or that category. Now think about this. For us to really understand God, we have to be in that category. We have to be spiritual beings. And God created us as spiritual beings so that we could have that, that ability to really fellowship with him. So God is spirit and he created us as spiritual beings so that we can have the capacity to connect with him, but we connect through our spirit faculties, not our natural faculties. Now our natural faculties help us, meaning with our eyes, we can see the crea see God's creation, we can you know, feel the wind and the breeze and we can praise God for it, or we can see the stars or we can study science or we could, you know, those natural things, they help us of course, but when it comes to spirit to spirit fellowship, we use the five faculties of our spirit to fellowship with God. Because we are engaging in the, uh, um, I should use the word same uh, realm or same category, his spirit, we have to fellowship with him in spirit and truth. Okay, I hope uh, I communicated that well. We'll get into it either. This human function of the human spirit is also a container. It's a carrier uh, of the grace, the power, the glory of God. And, and we see that described to us in scripture. The, the, those scriptures use the word vessels. And, uh, uh, and uh, you know, we are place where there's a, it, there's a resident, there's a, the dwelling place of God. We contain the glory and the power of God. And out of that, we give. The human spirit also has identity. You know, we've we've talked a lot about that in our first year. Uh, it's 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 who you are and knowing who you are. The spirit is also capable of action of doing things. Of you know, just like the human body can do things, the your human spirit takes action in the realm of the spirit. So imagine in the realm of the spirit, you're getting things done. When you when you and I know how the spirit can do things in the realm of the spirit, whether it's believing, serving, interceding, fighting, you know, in the realm of the spirit, you're getting things done, just like in the natural. And then another function is to keep growing into Christ-likeness. So we'll develop, we'll, we'll talk about these seven functions of the human spirit. Um, let me just uh, go into just one more thought, then I'll keep time for discussion. So, the born again human spirit needs to be nurtured. Let's just quickly, can somebody read Hebrews 5, 12 to 14, please? And, um, uh, we will look at it. We will be coming back to it later, but Hebrews 5, 12 to 14, somebody read that, please. Shall I read, Pastor? Please go ahead, please. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 12 to 14 says, for thou, for though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. And you have come to need milk and not solid food, for everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But solid food belongs to those 
who are of full age, that is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Amen. Amen. Thank you. So look at two contrasting terms he uses. Verse 13 and 14. He talks about spiritually being babies. And verse 14, he talks about being of full age or mature or grown-up adults. So now he's writing to believers, right? Hebrews, he's writing to those who are saved. But he's saying, look, you are like babies when you should have been grown up. And therefore their diet is affected. You, you only need milk and I can't give you, uh, you know, solid food or food that grown ups eat. Of course, the context here is spiritual. You talk about spiritually, in your human spirit, in your born again human spirit, he's telling these people, you're like babies. You haven't grown up to be adults, grown up people. And therefore you have to eat spiritual baby food instead of being eating spiritual adult food, grown up food. And then he also tells us the difference. He says, see, Here's one very important characteristic of a grown-up person. A grown-up person is able to discern good and evil, whereas a baby doesn't know that. A baby needs to be told, this is right, this is wrong, you know, or don't put your hand in the fire, um, you know, don't do this, don't do that, don't put your hand in the socket, uh, be careful, don't go here, don't go there. An adult discerns, is, has the ability to know good and evil. And there's a process by which that can happen. He outlines that for us, which we will look into a little later. Okay, so what did we cover today? We said that, you know, the human spirit, that's the real you. And the human spirit has personality, meaning the traits that you develop in the spirit. And what you develop in the spirit is going to come out as thoughts, words, and actions, which people are going to see. And then we outlined, we didn't get into the details, but we just outlined the five faculties of the human spirit, the seven functions of the human spirit, which we are going to get into detail later on. And what we are saying is there is spiritual growth that has to happen, we have to go from being babies to being people of full age. But this means, this involves the development of the faculties and the functions. Five faculties, seven functions, they develop them, develop them, nurture them. Then we move from being babies to being adults. And what we have outlined or what the writer of Hebrews says is the adults, one important characteristic is they can discern good and evil. Okay. Um, I actually wanted to do the next one. Um, okay. We have only six minutes. So I will take some questions and we guess we'll have to do this next week. Okay. All right. Yes, um, let's try to do the question answers quickly. Um, I see Beth has a comment, I think. I would have thought the personality of my human spirit can be corrupted by evil, tragic circumstances. Isn't that what mental problems are? Corruption or sickness of the human spirit. If our spirit can grow in a positive way, put on the gifts, it can grow in a negative way. Yes. So the answer, uh, if, if I have understood what Beth is saying correctly, um, I think what Beth is saying is that the human spirit can be corrupted or be affected, which is true because we will see later, and I've kept a separate chapter on the effect of the human spirit on the soul and the body. For instance, we see in the book of Proverbs, we read about things like a broken spirit, a wounded spirit. That means, uh, the, and this is something we have to 
guard ourselves, and I will share it in that chapter. We have to protect our human spirit because sometimes the, the experiences of life can wound our spirit. Uh, just a simple example is bitterness, right? If somebody deals very badly with me, yes, it affects me emotionally, but it will be really bad if I let it affect my human spirit. That means my very core gets affected and I'm tainted with bitterness. Then I would be bitter with people, bitter with this, bitter with that, and it'll come out. You know, people think of me as a bitter person. So I think if I understand what Beth is saying, uh, if I understand it correctly, I think uh, my answer to that would be yes, you know, that the human spirit can be affected in a negative way. Okay. I hope I understood your comment correctly, but forgive me if I didn't. Um, Divya, in Luke 9, 51 and 56, was Jesus exercising the gift of discernment of spirit? Is it right to say that? Or is he discerning the gift of the... Uh, 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 was he the gift of spirit? In, in uh, answer to that, uh, Devia is yes, because he was seeing into their spirit. So he wasn't just being moved by what they said, but he was looking at what was really in their heart. So the answer to that question from Devia is yes. Next one again from Devia. What are the spirit, gifts of the spirit? In, what are the gifts of spirit impacting? Are they empowering the faculties? Are the functions of the born again human spirit? So the gifts of the spirit are coming through the faculties of the born again human spirit. And they're actually releasing a work of God. They're a manifestation of God. So um, to answer your question, they come through the faculties and they are an expression of the presence of the Holy Spirit. Usually it's to get a job done, right? So that's what the gifts of the Spirit are, whether to, you know, in this case, discern or, or to heal, to work a miracle, to express God in some way, okay? Okay, okay Pastor, I just had a question. So uh, they, they don't have a role in developing the human spirit, right? The gifts of the um, um, Usually, I would say, like, you know, uh, the gifts of the Spirit are given primarily to help minister to people. Uh, but in the process, of course, we all, we're going to keep learning, you know. Uh, that means my knowing is going to keep increasing. Every time, uh, you know, you express a gift of the Spirit, you're learning something about the Holy Spirit. You're learning something about God. Even if that gift is to, you know, help somebody else, uh, your human spirit is also learning. So, yes, it will, even though the primary function is, to minister to somebody, to manifest the presence of the Holy Spirit, we will end up learning in the process. And uh, when you're praying in tongues, it's a big learning as well. Okay. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you. We have uh, two minutes. Let's take Mangi's question, please. Thank you, sir. Uh, my question is similar to to uh, Beth comment. Mm -hmm. uh, earlier on, when 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 you you were speaking about okay, that's a question. So can we say if I understood correctly that the fruit of the Holy Spirit is is it, it they are they are original originally uh, our, our original design that God has given us, and when we we are born again, we are, when we are sanctified they get revealed or they we so when when holy spirit is working in us then our true nature our true person our spirit being start manifesting freely and then we we exhibit the the traits of being kind being uh being good mm. Uh, the answer is yes, right? So imagine, okay, so this is the real person, my human spirit. The Holy Spirit comes and works on me. And he's developing, you know, the, the fruit of the spirit, love, joy, peace. So my human spirit was designed for that. Of course, you know, uh, uh, 
until I got saved, things could have been going wrong. But then I'm born again. And so now the human spirit has been given the life and the nature of God. It has the, uh, you know, the ability now to grow into the image of God, to grow into the nature of God. Then the Holy Spirit also comes and dwells here. And then he's developing, you know, love, joy, peace, all those things. And through my human spirit, that is being expressed, right? So when it says it is a fruit of the spirit, it is not just that the Holy Spirit is doing this independent of me or you. No, the Holy Spirit is nurturing these in your spirit and that is being expressed, right? Remember Jesus said, I'm the vine, you are the branches. The branches bear fruit. So you can imagine the human spirit like the branch, the Holy Spirit is working in us, and then the branch bears fruit. So the answer to your question is yes. These are virtues or character traits that are developed in your human spirit, which are then expressed through uh, uh, the outer person, the soul, and the body. Thank you, sir. All right, last one is Christopher's. Yeah, so Christopher um, uh, wants the explanation, Matthew 15, 17 to 18. Do you not yet understand whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach and is eliminated? So uh, verse 17, just talking about the food we eat, right? So the food we eat, uh, that just goes through the natural process, it's eliminated. So it really doesn't defile the man. It doesn't affect your spirit, you know, the food. But he says, verse 18, but if you look for the words a person speaks, uh, that comes out of the heart of the person, and those words also affect the person, is what Jesus is saying. Matthew 15, 18. Okay, the words we speak, they come out of the heart, and they also impact the heart. Okay, um, I think we'll have to pause here. Um, we will continue this next week, uh, talking more about this, but think about these things, okay? Let's close quickly in prayer so we could take our break and get into our next class. Could somebody please pray and dismiss us? All right, if there's going to be silence, we're going to be here for a long time. <laughs> Good, somebody jump in and pray. I'll pray first. Go ahead. Thank you, Father God Almighty. Thank you for your mercies, your grace, your love, Father. Thank you, Lord Father, for the amazing things that we are learning, Father. And as we are learning it, Father, we, we may use them, apply them in our lives so that we can develop our human spirit and be prepared for the coming of your day, Father. Be enriched by your word, Father. And bless the nation, bless your kingdom, Father. And spread your kingdom in the way you want us to, Father. Through your work that is being begun in our life, Father. Trusting that you will complete it, Father. In everything, we, we give you glory, honor, and praise for what you are doing, Father. And bless everyone, Father. Thank you for the pastor. Thank you for all the learnings. And thank you for your divine presence in our life. which And the Holy Spirit who who continually leads us, Father, and builds us up. We thank you for everything. We give you glory, honor, and praise, and ask this prayer in the precious and most matchless name of Jesus, our Savior and Lord. Amen and amen. 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 Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Well, take a break, and I'll see you shortly in the next class. God bless.